Welcome to Next in Tech, an S&P Global Market Intelligence podcast where the world of emerging tech lives. I'm your host, Eric Hanselman, Chief Analyst for Technology, Media, and Telecom at S&P Global Market Intelligence. And today, we're going to be discussing semiconductors and some of their impacts and what's changed in the market with returning guest, John Abbott. John, welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Eric. Thanks. Good to be back. Well, great to have you. And there's been so much that's been going on with semiconductors. If we were thinking even a year ago, we seem to be shifting back and forth with that pendulum swing of how important is physical underpinnings of a lot of our comp- compute infrastructure, how much is software based, and all it takes is a little bit of generative AI to suddenly catapult us back into a uh, focus on silicon, right? <laughs> yes. Absolutely amazing. When you've been looking at some of the results of GPU makers, it's just astonishing. And it's really brought a focus in on how important the underlying infrastructure is to support specific workloads. And for GPUs, it all started uh, 15 years ago, something like that, with GPUs, general purpose GPUs. It's a bit of a sort of contradiction in terms in some ways, but all credit to NVIDIA for spotting that so quickly. And that was way back in 2006 when it opened up the GPU software to non-specialists, really, with the CUDA language. And that sort of led to the development of an ecosystem of drivers, acceleration libraries, and support for AI framework over the next like 10 years. Um, I think there are a few full steps on the way. NVIDIA was one stage, it was really pushing grid which was a sort of um, way of sharing virtual GPUs across desktops and application instances, a turbocharged VDI, virtual desktop infrastructure. But it eventually it, it sort of really caught on first with Bitcoin miners and then data scientists using GPUs for training ImageNet. And by that time, by the time chat GPT came along at the end of last year, NVIDIA had a whole sort of fairly mature software stack, which was right on the mark, actually. So it's been pretty amazing stuff. Well, as you pointed out, to go through these various waves, I mean, this isn't the first time we've had a strong focus in these areas. It's not, (laughs) presumably won't be the last, but it did happen to come along conveniently right after the whole crypto collapse. Yep. And the various GPU makers were going to be in horrible shape and cheese. And then all of a sudden, November, bang, uh, it's all right back at it. (laughs) Yep. And um, I think we were always pretty worried about CUDA being tied to a single company's architecture. I was. I used to berate them about it quite a lot. But just like the Wintel partnership for x86 predecessors, there wasn't an alternative. So it kind of became a de facto standard. Well, and this is something that there's a transition that it wasn't just crypto and and then generative AI that that did this. There's some changes in the semiconductor market that have been happening over time. And, and that this was certainly a catalyzing event, a dramatic impact. We think about what's taken place. It is an interesting market, though, as you're pointing out, in that you've got one company that controls so much of this market and is seen as really the de facto GPU platform. Yeah. But, you know, there, there are other things that are out there. It just yeah. happens to be that it happens to be represented by just that one company. Well, except that we are now seeing some sort of competition from especially AMD and Intel, which is both of them are gathering pace there. So AMD recently launched uh, its MI300 GPU, be available later this year. And it looks really interesting. I mean, they've really gone to town on the advanced packaging. So there's a real sort of differentiator there between NVIDIA and AMD. Um, You know, AMD packs a whole load of uh, HBM3 memory inside for high memory bandwidth, and it's got a chiplet design, which could give it a real differentiator over time, performance advantages potentially, but also more flexibility in what it offers to customers. And NVIDIA, I think, has held back on chiplets because they're really still focused on selling as many of those high-powered most expensive monolithic GPUs as they can while the demand is there, which is sort of understandable. But the whole market is desperate for an alternative because of slight supply chain uncertainties and also because of inevitably high markups in price. So it needs to have an answer to the CUDA programming lock-in. And its answer is really to provide higher level tools for the less technical developers. And they can translate apps from CUDA 
and they're building native support for the most popular AI frameworks like PyTorch and OpenAI's Triton. And we've got Intel as well, but they seem to be a little bit further behind. Ponte Vecchio, which is now called the DC Data Center GPU Max, that's now out, but it's really HPC focused. And we haven't really got anything else from Intel until I think 2025 with Falcon Shores, which seems like a really long way out on this market. Uh, well, and it seems like though that they're addressing what is that fundamental issue that we see right now, which is a shortage, that there is this huge push and the pipeline has only so much capacity to be able to put this out. We take a look at what's happening in the market in terms of getting access to the computational power to be able to do what is primarily generative AI driven analytical workloads. We're seeing all sorts of weird and dysfunctional market dynamics right now. The fact that you've now got venture capital firms courting new startups yeah. with the allure of offering access to GPU yep. capacity, yep. that's clearly an indication of a market that's that's gone a little sideways. Yeah, it certainly has. And we've seen a lot of momentum here in the building of GPU clusters, both for internal use and external public use as well. So started with HPC with a high performance computing with a simulation and modeling things like IBM's Summit Supercomputer has 27,600 GPUs. Intel's got 63,000 in the Argon Labs Aurora, Aurora supercomputer. AMD's got 37,800 in Frontier and El Capitan. We're not quite sure how many there's going to be in that yet. Um, <laughs> but we're also seeing AI-specific clusters built in-house by people like Microsoft to train uh, chat GPT. Uh, apparently, they're working on a 25,000 GPU cluster to train chat GPT-5. And Elon Musk has apparently brought out his credit card and bought 10,000 GPUs. And then we're seeing hyperscalers like Oracle. Oracle was building a, four, a series of 4,000 GPU clusters for OCI. That's up to 32,000 in general. And it's working with Cahir, which is an open AI competitor that it says is more business oriented. So that's pretty interesting. And then there's new, as you said, there's a uh, VC-funded companies like CoreWeave and Inflection AI that are working on massive GPUs for cloud AI, generative AI services. And we've got a few ex-Bitcoin miners like Applied Digital as well. Ah, who are looking for new things to do yeah. <laughs> with all the capacity they yeah, built for mining Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> well, but I guess the hyperscale cloud providers have dipped toes into their own custom silicon for a while. And just thinking about what's happened with the semiconductor market more broadly, uh, we've moved to an environment in which there was that first push of broad generic capacity that was really what clouds were getting built on. And the idea was to have as uniform a, a substrate on which to operate. And yet, relatively quickly, most of the relatively large hyperscale providers started getting or started requiring specialized processors from the major manufacturers and started that evolution into, you know, they wanted processors that were slightly differently configured. So they had special versions of processors from Intel and AMD. They started really looking at things that are tailored to their particular environments. And we're going to give them capabilities that were slightly different than the mainstream market. Yeah, absolutely. The best examples of that, I suppose, are Amazon has built its own series of CPUs for a start based on ARM processors. And that's been fairly successful because it can control its own software stack completely. So it's quite free to do whatever it wants under the covers there. And it's been pricing those instances pretty competitively. And that's worked out pretty well. But on the more specialist front, Google with its TPU has been the most successful. Amazon also has Trainium and Inferentia, so they have AI chips as well. But Google's the one that's been the most deployed. I think in the end, all the cloud vendors are still using GPUs alongside these specialist chips they have. So that sort of proves that the market really needs something mainstream as well. And I think over time, we're going to see things like the TPU and Amazon Inferentia shifting, putting more emphasis on inference for AI modeling 
for AI workloads than the modeling, than the training side. Because in the end, inference is the bigger opportunity. It just needs some slightly different things. It doesn't need such high powered GPUs, but they do have to have very low latency, for instance, because they need to be distributed and linked into applications and end users where the inference is actually happening. And then we've got still some surviving AI chip specialists that don't use GPUs, things like companies like Cerebrus, GraphCore, Tens Torrent, and Samba Nova. And it's been a bit tough for them over the last few years because it's hard to gain traction in a market area like that when you've got a completely new architecture. But the demand for generative AI at the highest scale might be their savior because there are limits to GPU scalability. And I think we're starting to reach some of those now. You know, it was interesting. We were just talking with Jim Curtis about different forms of databases that are better focused on generative AI, and mm. we get the same thing in semiconductors. Yeah, it's interesting. But also the evolution, the hyperscalers started building their own systems about 10 years ago because they weren't getting exactly what they wanted from the mainstream systems makers. And now they've gone down to the chip level as well because they're not getting exactly what they want. But I mean, it's such an expensive business, and I don't think they really want to be in that business if there's something off the shelf. And we're seeing some pretty interesting stuff still coming from NVIDIA and AMD in the future. For instance, these new super chips with GPU and CPU combined, closely coupled, and sharing memory between them, like Race Hopper from NVIDIA and, and the AMD MI300, which I mentioned earlier on. So I think that's going to be interesting. But you do get hyperscalers dabbling in that market, and it's led to some m and I mean, AWS is probably the poster child for that, buying Annapurna some years ago. But yet yep. Microsoft went out and acquired Fungible. Yeah. Again, to give them the ability to manage their own supply chains and basically fill in some gaps in, in terms of what they want to be able to leverage. So it's been interesting to see how that progresses. Yeah, it really has. Uh, there aren't an awful lot of choices left in the acquisition market, though. Um, I mean, some of those ones I just mentioned have really, um, or, or maybe they'll be acquired. They have really gone, a lot of them have gone down the systems route as well because their chips are so complex that they need to do that integration at the systems level as well. So they're really systems companies. I mean, I know HPE has been working, for instance, quite closely with Cerebrus to combine the HPE Superdome server with Cerebrus's massive chip, which allows you to put a whole model into the memory of a single wafer to get maximum speed. So, oh, wow. Yeah. So some of those may be acquired, but they need an exit strategy. They've been heavily funded. Huh. Well, you know, you, you talked about architectures and building, you, you mentioned chiplets, and I think I just wanted to for our listeners, just quickly identify what is one of those other interesting trends in semiconductors we've seen, which is the, the shift from great, massive, ever larger chunks of silicon representing a processor to now being able to build processors with individual chips that all get integrated together. Yep. And it's got challenges in terms of mastering it. It's something that Intel had certainly spent a lot of time working on. And it's interesting to see AMD now heading that way, but it's that interesting transition that allows you to take what are fundamentally different semiconductor processes. Because right now, if you're building memory, you've probably got a fabrication process that works one particular way. If you're building processors, you've got a process that works a little differently and be able to then tailor each of those specific pieces don't have the great massive die that tries to integrate both the processing and the memory on the same device, actually simply take those individual chips and be able to bond them together in the finished package. Yeah. Well, I think it's really interesting. And I think it has to be done because I don't think you can continue to scale in the way that on a single die that you could in the past, it's just got to its limits. So you're right, in Intel with tiles and in AMD with chiplets, both been working on it. One of the advantages is that you can use advanced process technology for critical elements and less advanced process technology for some of the other functions. And that can lower the cost of the chip and give you more alternatives as part of your supply. But you need an open ecosystem around chiplets and tiles. If AMD sticks with its version and Intel 
with its, then it will remain a choice of either or. But if you can build an open ecosystem to have smaller companies building specialist capabilities, which you can then slot into a standard architecture from Intel or AMD or NVIDIA, that would be the ideal. Whether that will happen in our lifetimes, I'm, I'm not so sure. But I know that the Open Compute Project, for instance, is working on something along those lines. And it would be great to see that. The other benefit of that would be that you could start using some of these chiplets for lower powered, older architectures manufactured by the likes of you know, TI, uh, ST Micro, NXP, all those um, Broadcom, all those companies at the edge. And then you can start integrating more intelligence at the edge for distributed inference than we've seen so far, although it is coming. So I think that's extremely interesting. Well, you brought up the point about inference, and it is, I mean, that's the the high scale side of the AI story. Yeah. Training is going to happen relatively infrequently compared yes. to inference, which is where you actually take the model and, and are actually doing work. You are identifying images, you are processing data streams, and that's the thing, as you're pointing out, is going to be happening closer to the source of that data. And, and the place at which, of course, it's going to be happening in much greater volume. Yeah. It's interesting watching some of these approaches and as they split out, are these devices that are set up for training? Are they set up for inference? And what's the approach that they're looking at in terms of how they actually build the device and build out the architecture? Yeah, yeah. I'm not entirely sure I agree with you about training being a one-off because it seems that once they finish training a massive model, at least they can with the latest data, but it is a brute force siloed and really highly parallel operation. Whereas inference, you know, is a bigger opportunity and a, and a day-to-day thing where you need high performance and low latency, but you also need lower costs, lower power, and the ability to fit into a smaller form factor for edge processing. And I mean, some people think that inference might be best kept on CPUs as they currently are, the same CPUs that are used for other applications on the same server, for instance, maybe with additional AI throughput acceleration and some algorithm acceleration and stuff. So that's Intel currently does have most of the market for inference. I think more will go to specialist processors, ASICs, and potentially GPUs too, but a lot of it will stay, I think, on CPUs. Well, it is one of those questions when we start looking at sustainability aspects. Yeah. The silicon-based acceleration still has significant benefits in energy consumption. Yeah. Because you can you can do more with a semiconductor with, with dedicated silicon than with general purpose GPU CPUs. And we all know CPUs and GPUs consume a lot of power. Yeah. And it's that question of how do you blend the, the specialized capability with a general purpose capability and still you know, hit energy targets that, that start to make sense. Yeah, we've been doing, doing quite a lot of work with clients on sustainability at the chip level, which is people are becoming more aware of. Moore's law, obviously in decline, some say it's dead altogether. For years, the increase, increase in ch- the clock speed would be the performance boosts without any code changes. But as transistors got smaller, you know, they the doubling in the transistor count on a chip would see a corresponding drop in the power per transistor, but only by something like 20 to 30 percent. So the, there was a gap there and it's still growing. And the power density of, of these GPU clusters is just going to get worse and worse. And then we've got to start looking at uh, new forms of substrate, uh, gallium nitrate, perhaps chips will continue to get more powerful and more efficient, but that won't lead, I don't think, to less total power consumption because of the growth rates we're seeing. So the average server consumption continues to rise. So that's a major problem ahead. Well, there's, there's that the demand for raw computational power increases. Uh, we've got to deliver it somehow. Yeah. That's the challenge. Although it is interesting to see that there are now conversations around compute per watt right? and managing what that the, the power consumption is for that total compute load. Yeah. 
it, it's something that gets seen as a motivation to be able to upgrade to newer generations of computational hardware. And it's something that presumably is going to continue to drive that overall requirement for capacity. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to see where this continues to move forward. I guess we've seen the concern about sustainability already in areas like telecom, mm. where I think there was a big push to be able to go to all software, the virtualized radio access network, VRAN. Yeah. The whole focus there was that being able to move to an entirely processor-based version, moving away from dedicated hardware was going to give telcos flexibility. But it turns out that it came at a relatively significant cost for power efficiency. Right. And so now you've got kind of a rethink of a lot of folks coming back to how you're actually going to manage radio networks virtually for that part of the telecom story. And not surprisingly, GPUs and other acceleration technologies are playing a big role in yeah. figuring that out and actually making sense of the power. Yeah. AMD and NVIDIA, I think, have got uh, telecom versions of GPUs on the cards already out. And that's a good point. The, the verticalization of this technology is happening quite a lot as well. And in automotive sector, we're seeing auto-specific processors, for instance, along with uh, an auto-specific stack. So a lot of action going there and in verticalization, right? financial services and medical is another area. Well, it gets back to the point that you were making at the outset, which is that there's that level of specialization that starts to creep back in as we're trying to refine the approaches, what we're actually doing with particular tackling a particular problem and, and being able to provide a specialized way to do that, to be more efficient, more effective, to actually really deliver it. And guess what? Specialized silicon happens to be right back where it is all over again. Yeah. I mean, in a way, people would prefer just the one architecture to, <laughs> to apply for because it makes things simpler. But you just can't do it. There's too many performance gains to be had from specialized architectures. It's, you know, 10 times, sometimes 100 times people talk about. It's, it's too big to ignore. So one size fits all. It no longer really applies, I'm afraid, in the silicon market. It's a nice idea, but something that is, yeah. is harder to actually <laughs> tackle in truth than in, in practical aspects. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. Well, we what should we be looking out for in the year ahead and what should organizations be thinking about? Well, I mean, you should look at how to best get access to some of this technology. I mean, the early people doing training bought their own hardware because they had to control it. They needed access when they wanted it and they needed all the control that you get from on-prem data centers. But most people don't really want to spend that sort of money on their own hardware. So it's really sort of looking at what the cloud providers and including the second and tier specialists as well, who are really coming up with integrated stacks and services alongside their hardware. And that might be the best bet for, especially in the early stages of AI integration into your, your real world application, go for the, some of the service providers there and they'll guide you through and then evaluate after that, what the best way of spending money is on the hardware and the software. Uh, it's as with many transitions to new technologies, use those low risk paths that let you experiment. And then once you start getting into serious investments, figure out how to actually manage that as effectively as possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this has been great, John. Thank you for all the perspectives. It's been great having you back on the podcast. Great. I really enjoyed it. And that is it for this episode of Next in Tech. Thanks to our audience for staying with us. And thanks to our production team, including Carolyn Wright and Ethan Zimmon on the marketing and events teams, and our agency partner, The 199. I hope you'll join us for our next episode, where we're going to be talking about some of those cloudy market perspectives. Melanie Posey is going to be back on to look at the latest perspectives about what's out there in the cloud. I hope you'll join us then, because there is always something next in tech.